welcome to the SSAT Health uh, Quality Cost Containment uh, Panel Discussion. Uh, the panel was originally was supposed to be presented at the DDW in the last May, however, due to the COVID pandemic, now it's going to be restructured into a panel webinar. So thank you, and thank you for our panelists for joining us. My name is Vanita Huja. I am Associate Professor of Surgery at Yale School of Medicine. Also, uh, I'm a Chief of General Surgery at the VA of West Haven, Connecticut. Previously, I have about a decade experience in quality as a surgeon champion in Nisquip and also running a consortium in Pennsylvania. Uh, joining me is Dr. Dmitry Olnikov uh, from New Jersey. He just moved there uh, from the Midwest, so thank you. Um, he is chief of surgery and he's a professor at Robert Wood Johnson. So, and I, from what I'm reading, he has a condo on the beach, so enjoying life on the East Coast. So welcome, Dmitry. Um, thank you, Benita. All right, we have three great panelists, uh, Dr. Matt Carter. Uh, he is a associate professor and uh, recently president of the Bariatric Society uh, and uh, he's joining from MGH. And we have Dr. John Morton, who just came to Connecticut from West Coast. So uh, he's the vice chair of quality of surgery. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Morton. Nice and place. lastly, Dr. David Chang, he also joins us from Massachusetts General Hospital. He has expertise in quality research and healthcare disparity. Uh, so thank you. Um, Dr. Dimitri, do you want to say a couple of words before we start? Yes, Benita, thank you so much for the introduction. We are really looking forward to having a lively discussion. Um, we will ask each of the presenters to give their talk. Then we'll have a polling on a couple of questions that they have put together for us. And then at the very end, we will go through all everybody's questions and make sure that we have a nice and lively discussion. So if you have a question, please save it uh, till the very end, or if you pose the question, we'll address it at the very end. So thank you all for joining. Uh, just some housekeeping tack, if everybody makes sure they're on mute and this webinar is being recorded and it'll be on the SSAT website. So please do tell your friends to join and listen to our webinar. Uh, we are going to be accomplishing three learning objectives. Uh, the first one is to make sure we talk about transforming healthcare and disruptive forces, which will be from Dr. Matt Carter. We'll be talking about ambulatory surgery centers. Next up will be Dr. John Morton, who will be talking about quality-based value care and how we can accomplish uh, great healthcare. Uh, lastly, will be Dr. David Chang. He'll be talking how can we accomplish equity in healthcare, uh, especially we're listening to the news in COVID pandemic and how different races are getting affected by the pandemic. So I think it'll be a timely uh, discussion. Um, starting off, uh, Dr. Matt Carter will be starting talking about disruptive uh, healthcare with Ambulatory Surgery Center. Dr. Hutter? Yes, Vanita and Dimitri, thank you very much. And, uh, and the, for the SSAT for the privilege of speaking tonight. Um, let me just get this up and running. All right, is that looking okay? That's good. Excellent. All righty. So again, thank you very much um, for this Healthcare Quality and Outcomes Committee panel discussion on the relationship between cost and quality in healthcare. Um, I've been asked to speak about disruptive transformation in ambulatory surgery centers. Again, my name is Dr. Matt Hutter from the Mass General Hospital in Boston. I have no disclosures that are uh, pertinent to the discussion tonight. Um, I guess my only disclosure is I was an economics as an under an, an economics major as an undergraduate. And, um, and just recently actually completed my executive MBA at MIT. Um, so talking about uh, disruptive innovation, I think is, is very appropriate. So an overview of what I'll be talking about tonight, um, disruptive transformation, ambulatory surgery centers, um, defining really what they are and how ambulatory surgery centers work, why they make sense, uh, to talk about disruptive innovation and uh, specifically about the innovation cycle, the innovator's dilemma as put forward by Clayton Christensen. Now this is widely misunderstood, what actually disruptive innovation means. So look forward to kind of clarifying what that means, at least in, in Clayton Christensen's terms. Um, we'll talk about ASCs and if they are truly a disruptive innovation. And also talk about the specifics of healthcare market forces and how they're peculiar for, for uh, this area and what that means for a disruptive uh, innovation like ASCs. 
And then finally talking about could this lead to a transformation and specifically the impact of COVID on this and whether this is promoting uh, or um, in an accelerant towards us or whether this is delaying any kind of transformation with regards to ambulatory surgery centers. So first off the bat, uh, what is an ASC? Well, I think we all have in our minds what an, what an ambulatory surgery center is. It's a distinct entity. It operates exclusively to, fit, to furnish outpatient surgical services to patients who do not require hospitalization. So they're typically dis discharged less than 24 hours following admission. And, um, and basically, if to be a Medicare ASC, you should not have active medical monitoring at midnight on the day of the procedure. So truly outpatient procedure. Now this is different than hospital outpatient departments. And I think it's very important to try to, to, to determine the difference between the two. Although they might look the same, although you might not be able to tell the difference, the finances, the economics, they're actually very different. A hospital outpatient department is specifically owned by and attached usually to a hospital. It doesn't have to be attached. It can be within 35 miles of, of your hospital and still be a hospital outpatient department. The real biggest difference is in the regulations associated with these and the payments associated with these. So ambulatory surgery centers have seen a, a rise, uh, a dramatic rise. You can see in the graph over here that the rise between 1999 and 2011 going up from uh, over doubling the number of cases in the Medicare numbers. And right now, the number of ASCs in the United States is greater than 9,000 in the US. And so, but, but one would question, you know, why isn't this rise been quicker? If it truly is a disruptive uh, innovation or maybe a transformation, why don't we see an exponential growth and, and what's tethering that? Well, we'll discuss that more later on. So what is being done at an ASC? Um, so here we see some graphs um, specifically about the specialty performed in a multi-specialty um, Medicare certified ASC. You can see orthopedic surgery is doing a fair amount of work, pain clinics, uh, podiatry, plastic surgery, otolaryngology, ophthalmology are all included in there as well as endoscopy. Um, and you can also see in the single specialty that uh, ophthalmology is the, is the uh, big winner there. So ophthalmology as well as endoscopy are really the biggest uh, single center areas. Um, the overall trend has been moving towards outpatient procedures as we all know. That's because of advances in anesthesia, um, how it's given and uh, how people feel and, and their ability to go home afterwards. Also in the surgical techniques that are being done the more minimally invasive, laparoscopic, um, um, arthroscopies, things like that, the, the bigger penetrance of that, the more appropriate for outpatient procedures. And so that, that trend has been moving and, uh, and that trend's really not going back. So how do ASCs work? Well, first of all, you need to be certified and there's different accreditation with regards to an, an ASC, but one of the biggest ones is a certificate of need. So that's required in about half of the states. You can see in this graphic here, I have the states that require a certificate of need. And that could be a bottleneck or a barrier to entry for different people in that area um, uh, in order to, to establish uh, a certain an ambulatory surgical center. With regards to ASCs, there are also many different ownership models. Um, the physician ownership model, there can be an AS, ASC management company who's taking the, 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 the lead, and there can be hospital systems, but they're not always just one or the other. They can be hybrids of that. So there can be completely physician owned, um, and that you can see is the biggest slice of the pie at 64% of the, of the uh, ASCs that are out there. There can be physician owned, but associated with, um, with corporate entities like the ASC management company. So that can be a partnership. Um, physicians combined with hospitals as well, or, or a combination of all three. So basically five difference when you look at these three different players that are there, five different ways to kind of share them in order the, the ownership um, uh, models for the ASCs. And this really makes an impact on how these ASCs work. So when it comes down to this, a big difference is in the cost um, and the cost and reimbursement. Now, right now in healthcare, we're really not sensitive to costs. And that's one of the challenges that we'll talk about later on. But Medicare is trying to increase the transparency with regards to price and make people more price sensitive. The out-of-pocket payments, the co-payments uh, that patients have to do, the high deductibles that patients have, make them more sensitive to the costs that are out there. And here you can see in truly Medicare terms, removal of gallbladder using an endoscope. Some of us call that lap coli. Uh, they call it removal of a gallbladder using an endoscope, whatever. Um, but this is uh, uh, for a lap coli. You can see the huge difference here between ambulatory surgery center and a hospital outpatient department. 
again, sometimes you might not be able to tell the difference between the two, but there's a huge difference when you look at these payments. So you can see at the ASC, Medicare pays $1,755 and the patient pays $438. Whereas in a hospital outpatient department, the costs of the patient are over double and the costs that Medicare pays to that facility are more than double as well. So huge disparities with regards to the costs here. You can see how ambulatory surgery centers are the low cost provider from that standpoint. And, uh, and, and that makes a, a big difference. So why do these ASCs make sense? Well, when you think about hospitals, um, they're burdened by services that lose a tremendous amount of money not just the COVID patients, which we're dealing with right now, unfortunately, but the ER, the uninsured, even the insured on Medicare and Medicaid programs, they can lose money on those. There are tons of conditions that lose money. When the patient walks in with something, you know, weak and dizzy on the medical service, they're losing money. Um, procedures, on the other hand, well, they are the money maker in this fee-for-service world that we're currently in. If it's pay for quality down the line, it could be a different discussion, but fee-for-service, it's the procedures cath lab procedures, the endoscopy procedures, and especially the surgical procedures, not only the inpatient procedures, but the outpatient procedures. Those are the money makers. Those are the generators for the hospital. So if you have a hospital that focuses on interventions and does not have an ER or beds for other conditions that lose money, and it has low cost overhead, then profits could be, should be, would be substantial. And that's what an ASC is, okay? focuses on interventions, it does not have all of these side products and ERs, it is streamlined and focused on the patient experience and decreases the cost in order to do that. Now, better yet, if you are the provider and own the facility, so you're the physician owner, you get not only the professional fee, but you get the margin on the facility fee. As my kids say, boom, double payday. And, uh, and, and that makes a lot of sense and that's why we've seen a lot of growth by the physicians from that standpoint. Switching gears here from ASCs to innovation and specifically disruptive innovation. So this is the disruptive, the, uh, the innovation cycle uh, that's been described by many. Um, you can see initially it's in the embryonic phase, it's prototypes, iterative research, community building, not a lot of market size, it's kind of under the radar, people don't even hear, hear about it. Growth um, becomes the early adopters initially, com commercial feasibility, product launch, proliferation of fe features, and then at maturity, it's a dominant design um, that's maintaining markets as incremental improvement. They keep on adding on little tweaks and, and, and other things to that uh, in order to maintain at that level. And then at the aging level, you get commoditization, consolidation, and possible death of that, of that market. Well, how does this work with regards to disruptive innovation? Well, as you can see here on these S curves, the, the innovation S curves that are shown here, um, you can see initially that comes up to maturity and then there's a startup window and that's the innovator's dilemma. That is the market right there where the mature company, say the hospital saying, okay, we're at that level and we're serving these customers and we've built this brand and how can we now attract this other level down here? Um, and, and a lot of times they can't. Um, I thank Pierre Azoulay, who presented this at, at, at MIT Sloan School of Management, so I, I stole his slide, and, and I have to acknowledge that from that standpoint. Now, if you look at it from this standpoint, um, Henry Ford, you guys probably heard of the guy, right? The Model T. Well, the concept here is that if, if he had asked what people wanted, they would have had said faster horses. If you're a mature company and you're serving your, your current customers, and you say, okay, we want more bells, and we want more whistles, and we want faster horses, you're not gonna innovate like the startup can, that they can come in with a different area, they don't have to listen to what there is, they're gonna look for that niche market and they can create something better. That's what Henry Ford did with the Model T, that was a disruptive innovation. If you look at cars from that standpoint, actually Benz came in with the first kind of fancy four-wheeled, horseless carriage, um, all the bells and whistles, and disruptive innovation, is when they came down market, they had a, a, an affordable, not all the bells and whistles, a different market, and that took off, and that's why we have cars today. So this concept of disruptive innovation has been described by Clayton Christensen. Uh, this is his book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and it really describes a process where a product or service takes root in simple applications at the bottom of a market. It's usually the less expensive, it's more accessible. In fact, the people at the top of the market, they just ignore it. They're like, that's a little niche thing. We're not gonna worry about that. That's not what my customers want. But that down market thing relentlessly comes up, comes up, comes up, and overtakes the established competitors, 
boom, that's disruptive innovation. And that is the innovator's dilemma, is how to prevent that and, 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 and how to get there. So what is disruptive innovation? It is not breakthrough technologies. It's not the big thing that's out there. It's usually the small kind of under market area that then comes up and rises up and, and becomes the disruptor. And I think that's one of the biggest, that's how people misuse this term all the time. If you look at how people use, oh, this is disruptive, they think of this as the huge breakthrough technology that's the disruptor. It, it, that's not how it was initially described by Clayton Christensen. So try to use, try to use that term wisely when you can. Um, so are, are ASCs a disruptive innovation? Well, yes, they are cheaper. They're simpler. They're more convenient products or services that start by meeting the needs of less demanding customers. I, I, I just want to go and park and get my hernia fixed and go home the same day. I, I don't want to go into this big hospital and get confused and that, whatever. You know, keep it simple, stupid, and that gets it done. So ASCs are by definition, or Clayton Christensen's definition, a disruptive innovation. And this is from uh, the, the book Innovator's Prescription. It's specifically about healthcare and disruptive innovation. And you can see, similar to that Medicare cost transparency, they're talking about um, uh, a ASC, a Shoaldice Hospital, you've heard it, the Hernia Specialists of, uh, of Canada, versus a general hospital. You can see that the overhead costs are multipliers of each other, four to five times of the overhead costs at the, at the general hospital. And those dollars have to be made up. So how can hospitals respond to ASCs? Um, um, again, I had, sorry, I had to rip off another slide from Pierre Azoulay. This is related to, jo to Josh Gans. Um, but you can see here, hospitals can reply a lot, of different, a, a lot of different ways. You see up here this area called Skunk Works. Whoops, that's not the one. Up here, uh, Skunk Works. So Skunk Works is basically when the hospital says, wow, we need to be innovative, but we can't. We're a friggin' hospital. <laughs> Hospitals can't innovate. So let's put a few people out in this skunk works facility. They won't be, we'll go by our rules. So they're not going to tell us what they're doing. They're going to create something innovative. They're going to be a startup within our four walls, not hampered by our four walls. That's what skunk works means. And it refers to Lockheed Martin when they created um, bombers actually in, in World War II. Um, but that's what a skunk works are. Uh, acquisition, you buy the startup. Double up because you think you can do both of them at the same time, but usually you can't. And then leverage your complementary assets, whereas you say, well, we're the biggest, we're the Mass General Hospital, we're going to be the biggest hospital, we're just going to eat your lunch because we have such strength from that standpoint. So that's how hospitals can respond to the ASCs, and these are the different ways to do that. And leveraging the complementary aspects is what most hospitals are doing today. So critical here is why does healthcare not behave like other markets? So if, if ASCs make so much sense, if they're so much cheaper, then why why have they not? Why is that the, the, the movement linear and not exponential? Why are not they eating the lunches of all these hospitals? It's because hosp healthcare markets don't make any sense. I mean, this third party insurance that removes the decision from the consumer, the patient, they don't even know what the cost or the price is. They're not sensitive to it. Um, hospitals right now, there are all sorts of uh, uh, protections from regulators in, in the government. It's a public good. It's you can't get rid of our rural hospital. You can't get rid of, shut down this. We're going to do everything to do. So the certificate of needs that I talked about before, the regulators are saying, don't make more ASCs because we want these, these poorly functional small hospitals to survive. Would Adam Smith make that as a, a, from, from an economic standpoint, say that's, that's the way that the, our resources should be allocated? No. Not at all. Closed networks, limit referrals, choices, all these things make healthcare not have choice and not behave, not have transparency and not, uh, not uh, behave like re real markets. So this is a, a quote from Clayton Christensen, healthcare may be the most entrenched change averse industry in the United States. Hmm, that's pretty, pretty powerful, most. Uh, at MIT, when I was there, they would refer, there was a handful of MITs, of uh, MDs in our class, and they referred to us as incrementalists. Oh. Interesting you'd say that, Matt, because you're an incrementalist. <laughs> That's how they dub doctors. Um, so something to think about. Um, so really, many, so many stakeholders in the U.S. healthcare system support the status quo to maintain their positions and profits, and that's what medical centers are doing. That's why ASCs are not thriving in a lot of areas. And what about this COVID-19 thing? Will it fuel this fire for change? Absolutely. We have now found out that healthcare is not recession-proof. That when patients lose employment, they lose their insurance, and that's a big problem. Shutting down elective surgery has shown how dependent hospitals are on these dollars, and those hospitals are hurting. Um, and a lot of them are not 
swimming, they're sinking, or at best treading water right now when their elective surgery is shut down. So um, ASCs are a better option as hospitals are full and patients are scared of them. Right now we say that hospitals are haunted by the images seen on the nightly news. Who's gonna go into that COVID facility when they can go to an ASC and get their operation done? I don't wanna go to, the, we're hearing that over and over right now as we call up people for our elective surgery. And so once we open up the floodgates, there will be an exodus from the hospitals. This will accelerate the movements towards the ASCs. And innovation is one thing, but transformation is another thing. And a transformation is when you completely change from a caterpillar and then you become a beautiful butterfly. So if healthcare behave like other markets, then ASCs should really create that transformation. Um, they really could be the death of general hospitals and general hospitals really don't make a lot of sense. That's a story for completely another day. Um, but, um, but, you know, but healthcare is not a regular market. So it'll be interesting to see whether this transformation actually takes, takes hold. So in summary, we talked about ambulatory surgery centers, what they are, how they work, growth of them, the difference from the hospital outpatient departments. We talked about disruptive innovation and the innovation cycle and how disruptive innovation is actually different than just disruptive um, that many of us quote. Um, pointing out that ASCs really are a disruptive innovation. It's that low, low cost, um, um, alternative that's more simple um, that can actually take over um, the set from the status quo which is the general hospital but healthcare is really challenges for markets and they don't behave like other markets otherwise we would have seen this transformation years ago in the 90s when people were first starting to move towards ASC so could this lead to a transformation stay tuned I don't know um, healthcare doesn't move that way but you know this COVID-19 thing could be an accelerant so that concludes my talk. I look forward to any questions or comments. Um, I think we do have some the uh, the polling questions before we get going. And um, but thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. So, so Matt, here's the polling. Oh, go ahead. Is that Matt, Thank you. Yeah, these are the polling questions. If the pan, uh, if the attendees can just, if you look at the bottom, I think there's uh, you can just answer the polling question. So what percentage of your surgical cases that could be done in an ambulatory surgery center are currently being done in such a center? And then the second question is, in five years, what percentage of your surgical cases that could be done in an ASN, AASC will be done in such a center? Well, hopefully we'll be able to find the results of that polling. Um, I'm sure it'll come in eventually. Please vote. Um, <laughs> while we wait for it. Oh, there oh, it is. That. Oh, my goodness. Yes, look at that. So 38% right. of the people, um, none of the percentage of their cases. 38%, um, 1 to 25%. And we have very few on the upper end there. But you can see later on, um, in five years, the numbers have actually changed and 0% is only 13%. And many people feel that they'll be doing much more, many more procedures at the ASCs. And, uh, and I think that's probably the case. Thank you. I have one more question. There should be one more question. There was two. That's Those were the, the two. Second one. Well, oh, that, was... Those were the two, you're right. Absolutely, those were the two. All right, awesome, all right. Well, in that case, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. John Morton. Uh, he recently moved from uh, Stanford to Yale uh, School of Medicine in New Haven, where he is a professor of surgery. And uh, John is going to talk about the success story in improved outcomes with collaboration. Uh, John, I'll let you share your screen, and, and uh, we look forward to hearing your talk. Well, thank you, Dimitri. I mean, one of the reasons I moved out here is I heard you were moving out here, so I wanted to get closer to you, but it's a pleasure to be here as part of our uh, discussion today, and it's uh, terrific to be uh, at Yale, and I think I really enjoyed Dr. Hutter's talk. Uh, he points out, you know, the some of the inherent disadvantages of a general hospital where you're trying to do all things for all people, and we know how that works out. I think it points out 
the strength in systems, number one, maybe you could shift um, people around different parts of your system. Uh, that's certainly what we did at Yale when uh, we created our COVID minimal pathway, but it's uh, very thought provoking at any rate. So at my, um, my discussion tonight, and I believe everybody can see the screen. Um, is that right, Dimitri? You can see it? Okay. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can work together in collaboration to meet that value equation where we improve quality and decrease cost. I think uh, I'm a bariatric surgeon by training, by, a, by life uh, objective. Uh, this is my life's work and I enjoy it tremendously. You can see that we made a huge change in our outcomes over a very short period of time. Our mortality rates were about one to 2%. Uh, and they went down to now about one out of a thousand. And part of the reasons for that uh, is that we had accreditation, changes in procedure, better fellowship training, and we've continued that now with competency-based uh, bariatric surgery fellowship approaches. And I think I'm gonna highlight one of the ways that we work together to improve this, and that was around accreditation. And our accreditation program is called MBS Equip. And you can see there that we have over 900 participating centers uh, we are the second largest quality program at the American, of College, American College of Surgeons, only exceeded by the Commission of Cancer that is a good bit older than we are. We're only about eight years old. You can see we even have some international centers. So what is MBS Equip? Well, it's more than just the accreditation, which is a visit, verifications. We have standards. We have a registry. And one of the things that we are committed to is improvement around quality. That is in our lifeblood and in our DNA. And this is one of the studies that have demonstrated the advantages of accreditation. And I wanna point out its advantages are not only around decreasing adverse outcomes, but also around decreasing cost. And you can see that accredited versus unaccredited. And then there's one last row there and it refers to failure to rescue. And I think that is the, the unique power of accredited hospitals where they have the experience, they have the resources, they have the pattern recognition that allows them to see if someone is having a problem that will allow them to rescue them and not go on to have death. So we have not rested on our laurels within MBS Equip. We really have a belief that we are the medical home uh, for the patient with obesity. We've since introduced endoscopic standards as well as medical weight loss standards, which is becoming increasingly uh, more important. One of the reasons it's becoming more important is that we have terrific early outcomes at one year for bariatric surgery, but in some circumstances, there's variation about long-term. There are people that can regain weight. So there's a belief and a desire that perhaps if we are able to add complementary therapy, we can have um, better outcomes. And we're simply taking another page from what we've seen in cancer. Uh, where you have adjuvant chemotherapy before you operate. Same sort of ideas here. And with some of our medical weight loss uh, qualified uh, hospitals, we can hopefully implement that. And we can see perhaps getting people to lose weight before surgery, perhaps using it uh, to prevent recurrence of their weight. So there's more to that to come uh, within our, our program. I wanna take a moment to highlight that we've done a great job around decreasing mortality uh, when it comes to bariatric surgery, but we were also interested in pushing the envelope when it came to other places to improve. And one of the places we chose was around readmissions. You can see here that it's quite costly uh, to the United States and it became a metric of interest to many payers. One of the, um, this is one uh, example of it with uh, uh, HealthNet uh, that actually would not allow you to be part of their network if your readmission rate was above 5% in this circumstance. One of the reasons that it's become more interesting is because it incorporates, in, in, incorporates a lot of different aspects. It's not only around safety, but it's around satisfaction and ultimately around cost. And I really do think it was a, it was a great opportunity for us to work together. The other part of it is it's actionable. It's something we can change. It's hard to implement a bundle that's gonna decrease leaks after whipples perhaps but not so challenging if you're working around coordination of care. And if you look at the reasons why people get readmitted after bariatric surgery, almost two thirds of them are, if you will, preventable. They're around dehydration, having food indiscretions, uh, not taking the right kind of medications. And for all those reasons, we started to look into it. 
Uh, I did a pilot along with Tony Petrick at Geisinger where we did some uh, straightforward care coordination type of approaches, better patient education, calling the patient after they get discharged to home. And as Dr. Hudders pointed out, we wanted to use something other than the hospital because the hospital is the most expensive place to be. And we use clinical decision units or infusion centers for people to get uh, hydrated if they were dehydrated. And it was through some of these common sense approaches that we ended up reducing readmissions by almost 70% at, uh, at our institution. One of the reasons for that, again, is a better coordination of care. And we extended this pilot study to a much larger one. And this is our quality improvement project uh, that was the first uh, for us nationally. And we called it DROP, Decreasing Readmissions Through Opportunities Provided. And it ended up having 128 hospitals that worked together, uh, included webinars. We only met in person twice. And we had a mentoring system because for many people in bariatric surgery, QI was something new. We also had site-specific reports for benchmarking, as well as the, the following readmission bundle. You can see here the bundles uh, composed of three elements, education videos so people know what to expect. I have a happiness formula. Happiness is reality divided by expectations. And if you set expectations accordingly, you're gonna have a happier patient. We also gave patients nutritional consults across the board, and we had a clinical roadmap so people knew when they were going home but probably the single most important process was that discharge phone call after people went home, kind of cutting them off at the pass if they were contemplating going to ED or to another place. We were able to then figure out what's the best place for you to get care. Here you can see some of the outcomes. This is a typical run chart that we have in QI. You can see that the variation became less and it actually went below one of our run bounds at the bottom there. And here you can see kind of final results. You can tell by the end of the last quarter, uh, we were making some progress and decreased readmissions by almost uh, 27%. So it did decrease it nationwide. And this is, a, I've now seen a study that's gotten presented to one of our journals that shows that we have now continued to decrease readmissions even further. I wanna follow up with uh, two more examples of how we can work together. This is our second project uh, that we did, which is around ERAS. And it was led by Stacy Brethauer. ERAS, for those who don't know, is meant to meet the challenge of surgical stress and allow patients to get through that challenge in as minimal uh, stress situation as possible. And the idea is to uh, give better pain relief and really target both um, glucose management and fluid management. We had 36 hospitals that participated and these are the different elements uh, to ERAS. A lot of it was around pre-op education. Some of it was around carb loading. And then of course, using preemptive analgesia. And then in the OR, even more use of uh, different analgesics that avoided opiates, because as we know, they lead to more nausea and can have an extended length of stay. And again, better glucose control. Finally, getting people up moving around uh, was important and simplifying care, no drains, and no uh, upper GIs afterwards. Here you can see some of the results. Uh, you can see that we were able to decrease extended lengths of stay. The other thing that we did is we decreased uh, rate average length of stay, not by a lot, but almost by half a day, but still decrease. Here you can see that readmissions did not go up because oftentimes when you kind of push on one side, getting people out sooner, it can push back with readmissions, but we did not see a bump in readmissions. So in conclusion, you can see that this worked and I think there'll be more opportunities for us to work together. So I'm gonna close with one idea that I hope is uh, maybe disruptive or innovative where we think about using one surgery to help another surgery. There's this program called Strong for Surgery and the idea around it is to get the best prehab possible for patients. And I, and I think about it, what is better prehab than uh, bariatric surgery for the patient with obesity. You control their blood sugar, you control their blood pressure, get rid of that sleep apnea. So maybe we can work together in that direction. One example of this is in orthopedics. There's a million joint replacements done annually. And as you can see from this series of uh, uh, cited studies, when your weight goes up, your risk of complications go up tremendously when it comes to uh, total joint replacement. And it's a place that we perhaps can make a difference. 
one of the ways that we can make a difference is through a burning platform, the key element to change management. And what you can see here is that uh, CMS said, we're not gonna pay more for complications when it comes to joint replacement. So it created an incentive uh, for the orthopedist to perhaps send patients to get prehab through weight loss. And that's exactly what's happened. Uh, Raul Rosenthal and myself worked very closely together with AUKUS, the American Association for Hip and Knee Surgery, and we've come, come up with guidelines that now incorporate uh, use of weight loss as a means for prehab for those patients uh, with obesity and having joint replacement. Last uh, point I'll make is about how, again, maybe we can use um, surgery in a way to address one of the biggest issues that we have in healthcare, which is cost. If we look at national expenditures on obesity, um, they're roughly about uh, 20 cents on the healthcare dollar. And you can see from the slide that it's a dose dependent effect. As your weight goes up, uh, your amount of money that you spend goes up as well. This uh, one picture here demonstrates that, you know, we spent about 200 billion on uh, Obamacare that everybody was worried was gonna ruin us financially. If we had kept our obesity rates at the same level from 10 years ago, we would have had more than enough money to pay not only for Obamacare, but further extension of care and allowing better access. So I did a study uh, just this past year where we looked at the impact of bariatric surgery on cost. This looked at medication. We um, used the market scan database, very powerful database, all payers. It is not just Medicare and it allows you to track people longitudinally in contradistinction of things like the nationwide inpatient sample. Um, here you can see that we had um, a coding algorithm for them and a matching process, and we're able to follow patients for up to four years after surgery. Here's the matched uh, group. You can see they compared quite closely between um, surgical um, cases as well as non-surgical, very well distributed between the two groups. And here you can see some of the results. We did see decreases in the surgical arm of almost 23% uh, overall, decrease in, in prescription cost. The other thing that we saw is the majority of the decrease in cost were around areas in uh, pharmaceutical outlay that are high. And those include things like lipids. Those include things like um, management of blood pressure, but most importantly, around diabetes. And that's where we saw the biggest improvement. Here to quantify it in a different way, you can see that uh, it was very powerful when it came to diabetes, uh, almost a three, four, almost a 75% reduction in the number of diabetic medications being used. So one of the uh, um, one of the comments that was brought up by the paper we presented was what happens to other healthcare costs. You talked about medications. So we did a further study that will be coming up, coming out hopefully this year where we use the same uh, database, same sort of coding algorithm um, and matching algorithm to see if we saw improvements for overall healthcare utilization. And so we again followed patients out for four years and we also uh, compared them to a matched cohort uh, as I mentioned to you previously. The other thing that we did is that uh, we um, followed these cost trends based on what was expected uh, on the initial outlay year and, and followed it out uh, over time. So this way we uh, hopefully were avoiding some sort of cost bias that was expected. The, the last thing that we did was looked at the impact of lost work, you know, to see if people were present, you know, for work um, and there was less absenteeism. Um, it's difficult to get data around presenteeism, but we were able to get some idea around absenteeism through this. And here are some of those results. And just to orient you, um, we have a standard population, 18 to 64, that's in gold there. In red here, this is the matched cohort, morbidly obese. And this is the expected cost, the dotted line for those patients who had bariatric surgery based on their initial trajectory. Now the green is the patients who had surgery. So here, maybe in this one small circumstance, we demonstrated uh, a bending of the cost curve. We did not end up including the cost of surgery uh, because that is a cost that had uh, some time to get recovered. One of the other things that we saw is that this uh, improvement in cost outlay was further accentuated when you limited it to patients who were diabetic, mainly because they were high cost utilizers. And, and for these patients, we saw even better return on, um, on investment and we saw a, a substantial decrease in cost outlays. 
when we looked at when we were able to recover cost, if you will, and I want to say one thing, this is unique in surgery. Um, other fields of surgery are not asked to justify what they do. If they did, they probably wouldn't pass the test. But we wanted to take a look at some of the cost outlays. And when it came to just looking at direct cost, we came pretty close with a lot of these patients. Um, when it came, we got close to about $5,000 less uh, in, in a few years, about four years after surgery. When we, add, when we looked at the diabetics though, we definitely saw a cost offset for those patients. So there's definitely um, that cost of surgery was recovered. And you see that even further accentuated when you include the lost work uh, time offset inclusion. So in summary, we saw that there is definitely a decrease in the amount of, of cost. And I always say, if you're not gaining, you're winning. So this is an opportunity for us to perhaps have a further dissemination of what's a disruptive uh, innovation, which is bariatric surgery. So in summation, uh, collaborative care works. We can do it on a large scale. And these things are not mutually exclusive. You can have quality care and you can have decreased costs all at once. You can have your cake and eat it too. So with that being said, I wish everybody um, very safe health and um, greetings from New Haven. You can see our campus right there. So thank you all. And thank you again to SSAT and Dr. Hoosier and Dr. Olinoff. Thank you. Thank you, John. We're gonna do the polling now. Uh, do you wanna uh, go through the questions? Sure. What is the best process to reduce bariatric surgery readmissions, post-op phone call, opiates, inpatient RD consult, and always the favorite, the combined response A and C? And the second question is ERAS decreases length of stay, blood product use, or opiate use. Is there another? Yeah. yeah. And of course, the, the favorite is the use of A and C as well. We should have results in just a minute. Please have everybody uh, vote. I try to give a pretty heavy hint there. Well, there every we, answer is correct as far as we're concerned. There we go. It looks like people were listening. So two thirds yep. of them. Yep. There we go. Yeah, I think people were definitely listening. And it was a very, uh, very thoughtful uh, presentation. Thank you for that, John. Thanks. And um, I will turn it off to Manita, who's going to introduce our final uh, panelist. So uh, great talk, John and Matt. Our final panelist is Dr. David Chang. He also joins us from Boston. Um, I have known David now more than uh, 10 years or 15 years about. Uh, Matt had Johns Hopkins. He was my mentor for my MPH. Uh, and now uh, he's the director of healthcare research uh, at uh, MGH. So, and he's also been very, um, uh, in transforming quality in healthcare and done multiple peer-reviewed uh, talks and research about 250 peer articles. So look forward to your talk, David. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Again, uh, it's, uh, it's great to see sort of my mentee now in leadership role. Uh, you see this is my retirement plan. So you all become chair somewhere again if I need to do uh, visiting professors. So uh, let's get an opportunity to be here. Um, and uh, I have, a, uh, I have my, my topic is, uh, does everyone benefit from, from care, uh, from, from quality of care? And as a, the way these questions are framed, I guess you can you know, um, you guess the answer, and the answer is no. And so, but I actually have sort of two messages. First is really talking about this, this, uh, this uh, distinction between quality and disparity. But uh, the second match is, is a little bit more nuanced uh, and probably a little bit more complicated and is getting at the issue of how we fix this problem. And there are sort of two sort of uh, important issues I want to raise um, in terms of sort of assumption of normality and, and even going beyond and checking the scientific basis. Uh, so um, as many of you probably would have guessed, um, Quality improvement do not benefit everyone equally, uh, and there, there are not a lot of studies 
looking at individual hospitals. And it's a lot harder to look at this in an individual hospital level. Uh, I think the best sort of body of literature on this is by looking at accountable care organization, which is meant to improve quality and how the implementation of ACO have led to a reduction or not in terms of disparities. And I just randomly picked two papers, uh, both from our institutions. Uh, and it turns out as I was scrolling through the attendee list, I believe Dr. Anderson might be online. And uh, this is total coincidence. I did not pick this because I thought you were gonna be online, but hopefully uh, I, I am gonna sort of, sort of do you justice and, and describe your paper fairly. And uh, I think your paper is a good, point, uh, a good example where quality do not necessarily uh, lead to dis the reduction in disparity. In, in that paper, uh, uh, panel P and C, you can see some reduction in disparity. Um, and these are sort of six different conditions stratified by different sort of um, hospital or practice sizes. And only the practice by group are associated with better quality, we would assume that this panel is higher quality, this panel is just more volume and therefore price are lower quality. And we see in most cases, uh, the disparity either uh, persisted uh, um, or it remains the same. In really only about two of these cases, I believe that these are the two cases where the disparity actually reduced uh, going from left to right. So as the quality improved, the disparity um, reduced. However, in other cases, for example, in this case, uh, the quality um, going from left to right again in, in, in terms of improving quality, disparity doesn't seem to decrease. And in fact, it might actually have enlarged a little bit. And, and there are many sort of um, um, explanations of why this would be the case. Uh, we all know that there are differences in access to care, differences in care, and, and so uh, uh, patients who are in the position to access high quality care are probably gonna benefit more from the improvement in quality, more so than patients who have problem accessing care in the first place. So I think that's an important message that quality improvement do not necessarily lead to reduction in disparity. And, uh, and so in any sorts of quality improvement initiative, it would be helpful to see if the benefit we intend to deliver to our patients are actually being delivered to all patients, or is it only being delivered to the patients who would otherwise uh, probably have benefited already with or without the quality improvement initiative. Uh, but uh, then how do we fix this? Um, you, you know, uh, and I think there are sort of two issues I want to raise. Uh, one is this issue of assumption of a normality Whenever we see differences, uh, I think we often very subtly, probably unconsciously, uh, jump to the conclusion that one group is the normal group, the other group is the abnormal group, uh, and usually the majority population is the quote-unquote normal group. And I think the best example of this is a uh, paper that I was asked to uh, sort of moderate uh, at a journal club uh, when I was in San Diego. Uh, this is a paper from pediatrics, um, and this is a paper looking at ADHD rates. And this is a key graph on the paper showing ADHD rates uh, over age on the x-axis. In the graph, a four-point curve showing the ADHD rate in white, black, his patients. And I think what's interesting is a paper like this it shows a difference, but oftentimes people just jump to the assumption that the white group is the normality group. And so the conclusion of the paper and majority of the people in the journal club are because discussing ways to improve the detection of ADHD, that they might be access to care problem, and then talk focus on maybe there's issues in terms of uh, access to um, uh, care in terms of minority populations. So we talked about a paper, a paper and the entire group was talking about sort of how to fix the minority group, in fact, all this graph says is that there's a difference. It actually does not say which group is correct. It could very well be, there could be underdiagnosis among minorities, or it could very well be that there was overdiagnosis among white kids. Um, the graph by itself doesn't actually answer one way or the other. However, we oftentimes jump to the conclusion that the normal group is the white population and the other group must be abnormal. Um, and again, I have many examples that I could, I'll give uh, throughout this talk. And, and I think this is an example where before we fix a disparity problem, we should probably stop and ask, 
is there any uh, evidence that one or the other side is normal or could the, tr could, could the normality or the norm or the correct state be somewhere in between? Could there be both an overdiagnosis in whites as well as underdiagnosis while minority? So again, I think this is very important because uh, depending on what you think the problem is, your interventions are totally different. If you think it's under diagnosis among minority, then you can focus on access to care problem. But if you think the problem was over diagnosis, uh, then it's a, it's a very different set of interventions that you can imagine. Um, and so that they, so this is a, this is a, a slide that I was actually give uh, but the second point I want to make is, you know, before again we uh, look at the intervention, we should probably look to see if let me just actually just stop that. Uh, can you guys still? I hope everyone can still see this. This is again. I, I just want to just kind of make the point that um, for the last 200 years, most scientific advances come out of the U.S. and Europe, um, and the problem with this is uh, the population is still majority white. And for someone like me of Asian descent, we, and, and Vanita as well, we make up less than 5% of the US population. We're a total of 15 million people in the entire US. And so it really raised a question that uh, studies uh, just for the last 20 years, how much of it may or may not be generalizable to a non-white patient population. Um, and I have several examples of the last decade. Uh, the most recent one, uh, or perhaps one that has received the most publicity, is this one looking at breast cancer catalog guideline. And we know that we all know that the federal task force, in terms of guidelines, uh, raised the breast cancer screening guideline screening age to 50 from the 40s. Uh, and it's based on studies that show that the majority of patients develop breast cancer in the 60s, and very few develop them in before 50. And this was reaffirmed in 2016. Uh, again, this is the, the JAMA surgery paper that I published in 2018. And again, the point is that the guidelines are based on eight lectures. I showed that the peak incidence was in the 60s, and very few people look at it under 50. However, from talking to my colleagues overseas, uh, I did a talk in Japan, and a Japanese colleague actually said they actually started screening in the 40s. Uh, in fact, I actually went down to Mexico uh, one summer to do a talk, and uh, they also actually have done studies and decided they should be start, uh, should start screening in the 40s. And so when I came back to the US, I decided to try to data, and I found and you're going to take over the voiceover. The, it turns out the only group that peaked in 60 were Caucasians. Every other group, white, uh, black, Hispanic, Asians, they all peaked in the 40s. So again, this goes to show that practice guidelines are developed based on a predominantly Caucasian populations may not generalizable, may not be generalizable to a non-white population and may in fact be causing harm. I think this is a perfect example of someone that could be doing perfect care according to the guideline, waiting until 50 to scream for breast cancer and in fact would it cause harm without knowing it. Um, and so again, raising the point that how much of our scientific basis may be generalizable to a non-white population. Uh, another example that we are actually just completing now is looking at this issue of DVT prophylaxis. DVT prophylaxis is recommended as a routine after major surgery. Again, from talking to the colleagues overseas uh, in India and in Japan and Taiwan, surgery is an issue for the patients that they do not give the DVT prophylaxis. So again, I decided to look at the U.S. national data, stratifying uh, the DVT risk by race. And it turns out that Asians are half as likely to develop DVT than whites. And if you actually look at uh, the counterfactual of this, that in terms of uh, hemorrhage, it turns out Asians are 50% more likely to develop post-op hemorrhage than whites. So put both of these together, Asians are less likely, about half as likely to develop DVT, about 50% more likely to develop post-op hemorrhage. So if you put this together, the risk-benefit ratio for Asians in terms of DVT prophylaxis is only about a third of that of white population. This actually echoes some studies I've done in the past looking at ground-level fall that show that Asians are twice as likely to suffer ground-level fall and have mortality after ground-level falls than other racial and ethnic groups. Um, other studies in, trans, uh, in surgery. Uh, this is a study from my days at Hopkins. Uh, there was a study that talks about 
uh, that found that kidneys from black donors were associated with low graft survival compared to white kidneys. Uh, and very subtly, that paper implied that black kidneys are reverse. And, uh, and in some way, they were recommending a sort of a separate sort of or donation system where organs are segregated based on the race of the donors and, uh, and the, the recipient. At some point, I had the honor of having a joint appointment with Howard University and uh, based on sort of the, the mentorship of, of, that I received from um, uh, folks at Har uh, Howard University, we decided to redo the study and again, stratifying by race, but we found that this, this problem of black donor having worse outcome only existed when it goes to the white recipient. This does not happen when the recipient was in other, was with us other racial ethnic groups. And so this problem um, only just again among white, uh, white recipients when it comes from the black donor. So this problem only happened in the black white pairing. So is a problem with the black donor or is it a problem with the white recipient? And again, and we had, I think most people would just assume that since the white recipient is the largest population, what you would see in the white recipient group might be generalized more to other group, when in fact that may not be the case. And going beyond transplant, but going beyond surgery at all, this is one of my first paper. In fact, this is the paper where before I even get my PhD, um, and asking a question about uh, leukocytosis in trauma patient, and, and, found, and we found basically that uh, Black patients are less likely to develop leukocytosis after infections. In fact, our finding is not exactly novel. People have actually reported this from the military. Healthy military recruits uh, on baseline have low, uh, black healthy military recruits will actually have lower white counts um, than white uh, um, general population. And so if black patients have lower white counts on baseline, then it would take a much, much harder, higher infection and much, much higher leukocytosis for that to cross the threshold that we would define as leukocytosis. Uh, and most recently, and I bring this up because I talked about this with Vanita when I was down in uh, New Haven a few months ago, the ratio, uh, the more likely that it could be a sort of outcome. Uh, and and in fact, this is actually from the Johns Hopkins ophthalmology website saying that the ratio greater than 0.7 only happens about 2.5% of the uh, population. And, and so it raises suspicions that glaucoma may be issued. Uh, it turns out, however, that this 0.7 ratio is actually fairly common among Asian patients. In fact, I have a Asian medical student in her 20s, which she asked me, and actually with thought to have glaucoma when she finally got a specialist who said that this is actually very common among Asians. Um, so this is the basis of a study that we did recently that's been accepted for publication. It's actually just accepted for publication, so I don't have the reprint um, or the proof, but it basically looked at a lot of the guidelines and asked a set of questions. What portion of the paper, uh, of the population that made up those papers that made up those guidelines are actually Patients are not white. Um, turns out, in most cases, they are single digits in terms of percentages. And so, when I when I sort of highlight the fact that we often focus on the delivery process, and oftentimes there's an assumption there is a bias in the healthcare delivery process, such as discrimination. That may be the case, although I, I did like to give the, you know my colleagues here in the panel the benefit of the doubt. I believe. People who are biased tend not to pick healthcare as a profession. They might have picked a different uh, career path. Uh, probably it's not so a problem, but really less of a problem of the industry. I worry that a lot of the disparity problem happened not because of flaws in the delivery process, but flaws in the scientific basis. And the fact that most of our science has not been generalizable, has not been representative of the population that we see today. So, and that, those are my take home messages. Not everyone benefit equally from quality improvement effort. I think that goes without saying. Uh, but we should keep in mind that this one size does not fit all. Uh, we need to avoid assuming that findings in a majority population is the correct state. Uh, and we should really try to reevaluate the scientific basis for non-white patients. And this last bullet point is hard because again, that's the basis of our science today. But we should strive to really relook some of the science to make sure that they are actually generalizable to non-white patients. Thank you. Vanita, you are muted. Uh, hey, Amy, do you have the poll questions for the? Right, there you go. 
So I will give a minute for everyone to chime in. Yeah. So I, I did these questions uh, not sort of based on my talk. I, I'm doing this uh, these questions based on the assumption that you have all been participating in one form or another on some kind of QI intervention. So pick any QI project that you've been involved in uh, and then kind of go through this. Amy, how do we get to the third one? Or do I just go with that? Uh, we'll give about a minute for everyone. And make sure everybody scrolls to the bottom. There's a third question. Yeah. Just to keep everyone awake at night. It's getting mm -hmm. kind of dark now. <laughs> that was great talk, David. Three wonderful talks. So, but... All right. David, take over. Oh, interesting. Ah. Thoughts, David? That's interesting. So, uh, yeah, I, I think this is, uh, I'm glad that people are actually stratifying and looking at outcomes separately for different populations uh, and not making assumption that, uh, you know, whatever we're seeing, you know, overall might apply. The problem with, with the minority population is whatever numbers you get is going to be averaged out and drowned out by the uh, larger population. So it is important to stratify your analysis to make sure that, uh, you know, you're actually seeing different signals, the different signal from the different subpopulations. So I'm glad people are actually doing this. Uh, I guess it's not surprising the outcomes are worse. Uh, and again, I think, you know, without even looking at the literature, I think most of you can guess that the most of the literature today are not representative of our populations today. Um, and I think five to 10% is probably fairly normal. And for someone like me and Vanita, I think there's always some sort of a single digits of token Asians in every study. <laughs> All, right. All right. So, uh... Up next, uh, uh, Amy, does, do we open up for the questions or do the attendees can type in in the chat box? All right, while well, we are waiting for the questions to be typed in. Uh, Matt, um, what do you think, you know, with the effects of COVID are on ASC? I saw somewhere that uh, ASC are becoming COVID testing centers. Uh, thoughts on that? You know, what do you think the future is? Well, you know, COVID is impacting different areas differently and, uh, and at different times, too. So you can't make a, 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 a sweeping generalization. Um, for example, Texas was up and running doing certain days, shut down, opened up again and shut down again with regards to elective surgery. So I think it is different in different, different areas. What we've seen is um, people are afraid to go back to the hospitals. And, and so people are you know, getting pushed out there. Some of the providers are actually, I, I for the first time operated in ASC and I three or four days of just putting all my cases that could be done out there were done out there. I never stepped foot in the place before. And uh, we had that place up to full capacity because our hospital wasn't. So I, I, I think there is a bit of an exodus from this and it's a good opportunity, I think for people to appreciate the benefits of that and, uh, and for patients to feel more protected in that environment. So thank, that's you. A, thank you. That's a, a very good, uh, different way of looking at it. Dimitri, take over. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, uh, thank Matt for his uh, presentation. Um, you know, New Jersey uh, happens to be um, uh, the first ASC state. Uh, the first ASC uh, was founded in New Jersey, hmm. and it's a ASC uh, rich environment here. Um, I got to tell you, um, you know, the one thing about ASC is that, that, that everybody um, understands but doesn't mention is ASCs are not subject to EMTALA laws, which means they can close at 5 p.m. and open at 9 a.m. and they don't have to worry about any emergencies or any other problems and they can do a wallet biopsy. <laughs> and boy, if that biopsy comes back as uninsured, you know, it's a stop. What do you think of that, uh, Dr. Hutter? Well, you know, I, I think that's why they should be paid less, and that's why they are paid less. Um, but I think I think they can provide better patient-centered care at lower costs, and I think for the right population, that's great. I think for, for those 
the, those who don't have insurance or are underinsured, um, or if with complexity, they should be cared for and in a different setting where it's safer to do that. But that doesn't mean we should provide low cost care that's high quality in the right setting for those there. It sounds like cherry picking, but I think you have to make the incentives work out for, for the, the risks too from the patient side and from the provider side. So, um, you know, I, I think we have a big cost problem and this is a, a, a way to do that by increasing quality and patient satisfaction. I, I think you got to look at why you still have a hospital. You know, what's the point of keeping somebody in the hospital afterwards? It's to make sure that they're safe and you recognize complications. And I think eventually we're going to get to digital, right? We're going to have like pulse oxes, blood pressure, temperatures, all digital. You know, people are going to be better educated about how to care for themselves. I think we're going to see more of that because Matt's pointed out, hospitals aren't always the best place to be. Yeah, and there's no question in my mind, and I couldn't agree more with what Matt said, is that the regulation is such that the hospitals, by their regulatory burden, are um, a different animal. Now, the question is, how do you distribute costs across a healthcare uh, continuum? Because it is a continuum, right? You know, the least cost, of course, is, is as John says, at home. And um, uh, I'm going to do a shameless plug, but Sages has just officially approved a brand new committee which I happen to be uh, uh, honored to run. It's called the Digital Surgery Committee. And it's look, looking at the ability of us to provide uh, digital surgical care um, in remote uh, home and other environments so you don't have to bring those patients into the hospital at all, or even the ASC. So then the question then, um, and, and this one is to John, is if we are able uh, to provide care outside of hospitals, um, you know, what happens to hospitals? It's a good question. I mean, we're already seeing what's happening to some of them. The rural hospitals are in, in rough shape. There are many hospitals that were operating right at the margin. They didn't have, you know, more than one or 2% of margin. Uh, I think you're gonna see a few things. Personally, I think we're gonna see further consolidation of the healthcare system. You're gonna see more hospitals be gobbled up by more systems. We already have some pretty mammoth systems out there. I mean, uh, just up north here, there's, I guess, a state called Massachusetts. Partners can't add any more people because they, they have so much of a, they already have such a big market. The attorney general told them they can't do more. So I, I think, you know, we're not at that point yet at Yale, you know, with Connecticut, but I think you're gonna start seeing more and more systems come into play. And I actually think that'll end up being good in terms of delivery of care, because you'll have different platforms. Whether or not it translates into improvement in cost and outcomes, I don't know yet, because those, those things are all, not always aligned. Because sometimes, I think there was a paper not too long ago that showed when they consolidated systems, there was not a decrease in cost. There was a little bit of a um, monopoly that was going on. So you've got to look at it from that angle as well. So I want to tie in with David. What do you think with uh, the, maintaining the quality for minorities? Uh, we know in COVID, the Hispanics and Blacks have higher mortality. How do we make sure that the ambulatory surgery centers are serving all of us? Yeah. So I think uh, obviously this would improve access, uh, you know, so having more touch points, uh, having uh, allowing people to not having to go to the hospital, which tend to be, you know, in, in areas, uh, well, I guess in Boston, they're not as accessible. Um, I guess though, uh, I, I wonder uh, as Matt says, a hospital outpatient department could be 35 miles away. So functionally, um, what would be the difference between a hospital outpatient department versus an ambulatory surgery center? Because a hospital outpatient department could be 35 miles away, so you could avoid the same issues. So what's to prevent MGH from building a uh, outpatient surgery center? That's exactly where an ambulatory surgery center is. Because that would avoid the issue of you know, having to go to a big hospital but still functionally be owned by MGH. Any thoughts, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's one of the ways to to react to that. I mean, I guess the point that I would like to make there is uh, is look at those copays. So if if the barrier to to care is some of those copays, some of those high deductibles, we decrease that barrier to care. They can get good 
quality care at a lower cost. And so for those who don't have, that might be a better better way to do that. The challenge is what Dimitri pointed out, is that people put flopping those ASCs in areas where the, the wallet biopsy is going to be very positive. Um, and so uh, so that that's that is the discrepancy there. But you know, to be honest, I think I think market forces should be allowed to to function here. I think if people are not are underperforming or have too many costs, then they should be called out on it. Um, and that's how we're going to improve healthcare. So so open up some of those market forces, protect those who need to be protected. Um, I think that there's, uh, there's definitely a role for that. There's always a healthcare should be a public good to a certain extent, but it doesn't mean we have to inflate costs when we don't need to. We have to bring someone in and have all the bells and whistles and specialists and in, in, in a main operating room here at the MGH to do a hernia um, because that doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. Now, the one who's a cardiac transplant, post-transplant patient on an LVAD who needs it, yeah, they should be done here, but uh, and not in the ambulatory surgery center. Um. So how do you make sure that, uh, you know, uh, I just had one of my undergrad students and her father had to go to the hospital and she said, you know, the, you know, the usual the anesthesia bill was separate than the doctor's, you know, the surgeon's bill and, you know, the anesthesia bill was not covered. So how do you make sure that, you know, patient going into surgery centers, uh, you know, everyone is covered at the same time? That's a, that's a that's a national problem with surprise billing that I think we just need to have an answer from a professional standpoint. That's not okay um, for a patient to wake up and not. That's the problem with transparency. That's people gaming the system, and and we need to do better as a professional and and as as healthcare folks not to have that. There, there needs to be transparency there. I think we also need bundle payment. You know, we bundle payment at the end of the day is going to force us to kind of have a price that we stick to. I think the problem with it is defining the episode of care is sometimes harder than we think. Um, there are places that have done it better than others. Geisinger's done it with proven care. They give you one price, they stick to it. You better have good cost accounting if you're gonna do that and you better have good outcomes because otherwise you'll eat your lunch. I think that's the other thing is like, we don't know our cost as well as we should. Um, and if you don't know your cost, you cannot appropriately price. Yeah, I, I would echo that. And I will tell you, nobody understands cost better than bariatric surgery and plastic <laughs> surgery because we have to create self-pay pricing. And I will tell you, once you dive into that um, complicated uh, situation, you learn a great deal just on that event alone. Yeah. You learn about reinsurance, you know? Oh, wow. Well, okay. Yeah. Um. So this is a very good talk. Uh, thank you for everyone joining in. Uh, it's about 8.15. Um, any last uh, thoughts from everyone? Dimitri, John, David, Matt? I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. I thought it was a great discussion and I look forward to future discussions like this. Well, thank you all for inviting us. And I, I wanna say that I don't think cost and quality are mutually exclusive. They can coexist. It's called value. And you've heard that tonight. You know, there is a way forward. All right. I, David, sorry. Oh, no, no. Just uh, thank you again for the invitation, Vanita. It's, uh, it's great to watch your career grow. All right. So it's great to hear from all of you. And I think this is a good start. Uh, maybe in a couple of years, we will see how we can make sure that we keep continuing, that we have great forces uh, and we'll be heading in the correct direction. Well, thank you. And all good night. Nice. Yes, this will be recorded. So, so please uh, find the link and send it to your uh, friends and, and the yeah. peers, uh, those who couldn't join us tonight. Um, I think uh, a discussion like this deserves to be viewed and reviewed and, and uh, may, may I dare say go viral. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.